Hi everyone, it's me, Adrian Lee, the Wandering Art Historian. Thank you for joining me for yet another video in our ongoing web series, How to Read a Painting. As you know, we have been talking about symbols for the past couple of videos, and we'll talk about a very interesting symbol in art today, the bull or the ox, and maybe a few cows here and there, shall we? Let's look at this incredible image. You may have seen images like this before. These are cave paintings. Um, this particular image is found in the Chauvet Cave, which was discovered in 1994 in southern France. It's actually five times larger than the caves of Lascaux, which is impressive in its own right, okay? These paintings date back 35,000 years to the Paleolithic era, and they're the subject of Werner Herzog's film Cave of Forgotten Dreams from 2010. Um, clearly, even from this image of cave paintings, you can see that there's a sort of activity, movement, or energy, and that's still true throughout art history as the bull or the ox are sometimes associated with thunder and lightning with a stamping of their feet. Um, their horns form a crescent shape, so they are sometimes um, a symbol for the moon. Yes, um, cows are an ancient symbol of maternal nourishment, another Mother Earth type symbol. To Buddhists, Cows are revered. They are, the, they are representations of the quiet, patient rhythms of life that are a parallel to holiness. Oh, I love that. Um, cows are sacred to Hindus, and the image of a cow represents happiness. Taoists and Buddhists use the ox as a symbol of the sage. So very interesting spiritual implications for something that, honestly, I don't know if off the top of our heads we would associate with spiritual symbolism, right? And that's in the East. What about in the West? Well, in Judeo-Christian uh, religion and in art, it is a symbol of sacrifice. It's a benevolent symbol of strength, patience, submissiveness, and steady toil. And the ox is actually one of the symbols of the four gospels. What are the four gospels? Those are the first four books of the New Testament of the Christian Bible, and each one of those books tells the story of Jesus from a different perspective. Um, this perspective is of the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now here's the thing, in art, how do you depict people that we've never seen before? We don't have photographs of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to to paint accurate representations of them. So we do it through symbols. And that is what you see here on the screen, two different interpretations of the four evangelists. So let's dive in, shall we? We're gonna start with this painting on the left. Here we see four gentlemen and they're all busy writing. They're writing their gospels, that's so sweet and they each have their symbol with them. Here we have this gentleman, and he's being assisted by this angel. That would make him Matthew, Saint Matthew. Here we have this nice guy. Does that, does that look familiar to you, that gentleman right there? He should. Do you notice he's doing that loving, <gasps> pondering look again? Young face, covered completely in red. That's our boy John, John the Evangelist. And he's with his symbol, the eagle. Yes, here we have this gentleman hard at work. Where's his symbol at? It's right here, hanging out under the table. It's a lion, so that is our friend Saint Mark. And then over here on the far left, I love he's in blue, right? This is our friend Saint Luke, and his symbol is the ox. Now, an interesting side note and a little piece of art historical trivia for you. St. Luke is the patron saint of physicians. It is believed that St. Luke himself was a physician. 
He is also the patron saint of artists. Why is that? Two reasons. Um, there is a mystical story that Luke received a vision of the Virgin Mary and painted her portrait. That's pretty cool. But also because both physicians and artists use herbs and minerals and grind them with a mortar and pestle to create their medicine and their paints. That's a really cool connection, isn't it? And that's why this artist has chosen to include a palette with paint brushes at the feet of St. Luke. How awesome is that? We see a similar composition in the painting on the right. Let's take a closer look. Oh, here is our young beloved John with his eagle. Here we've got Mark with his lion, Matthew with his angel, and that would make this Luke with his ox. Great job. Both of these paintings date from the 1600s and one of my favorite time periods, the golden age of Dutch Baroque painting. The painting on the left is by Abraham Blomart and the painting on the right, our friend Peter Paul Rubens. Let's look at another image. Now maybe you're saying to yourself, well, Adrian, maybe that was just the trend for the Dutch Baroque period, the 1600s, and the Dutch artists just chose to use these symbols to represent the four evangelists. And I would say, oh no, oh no, this trend predates the golden age of Dutch Baroque painting by a few hundred years. Check this out. Here we have two images that are two different illuminated manuscripts, okay? Those are the fancy hand printed and hand decorated books that are typically uh, collections of books of the Bible. And here we have two examples of gospel books. Those would have been collections of the first four books of the New Testament. And look at how the artists have represented the evangelists. In the image on the right, we have four men hard at work writing down their gospels and they're surrounded by their symbols. Let's take a closer look. Here we have the angel with St. Matthew. We have the eagle with St. John. Here we have the lion with St. Mark, and here we have the ox with St. Luke. Pretty cool, huh? Now in the image on the left, it's very much a different take, very ornate depictions of the four symbols. We have our angel, we have our eagle, we have our lion, and we have our ox, representing the four gospels. What do you think the time period is on these two images? Are you ready for this? It's gonna knock your socks off, ready? The image on the right is from the Aachen Gospel that dates around 820 AD, I know. And of course, this image on the left is from the Book of Kells and that dates around 800 AD. Incredible, I know. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wow, Adrian, that must be the earliest representation of the four evangelists with these symbols. And I would say, mm-mm, check this out. This is an incredibly beautiful mosaic. Yes, where is this found? It's the vault mosaic at the Archbishop's Chapel in Ravenna, Italy. And what you see here is a very interesting representation of the four gospels. We have an angel at each corner, but we also have the symbols with wings and books. Do you see here we have the lion, wings, book. Here we have the eagle, the angel, and the ox. Very cool, right? What do you think the time period is? 494 to 519 AD. How cool is that? I love it. 
So these are religious um, incorporations of the symbol of the ox. What about mythological stories? Do we see the bull or the ox in mythological stories? And I'm here to tell you, yes, you do. Here we've got two representations of the same story. And if this story sounds familiar to you, it's because it involves one of our characters we've already heard from multiple times already, Zeus. Boy, that guy gets into trouble all the time. And he likes to seduce women by turning into creatures, doesn't he? We've already seen it with Leda and the Swan, right? Similar story, Zeus stumbles upon Princess Europa, who is bathing by the riverside with her maidservants. How does he plan to woo her? He turns himself into a white bull and kidnaps her and takes her far away. Where does he take her? Well, think about this. Mythological stories are used to explain the inex inexplicable and our princess's name is Europa, so this is the explanation for the existence of the continent Europe. You gotta go with me on this one, right? So here we have two depictions of the abduction of Europa. The one on the left by Rembrandt, the one on the right, Martin de Vos. Pretty cool, huh? Boy, he really does get these ladies by turning into creatures, doesn't he? I guess whatever works, right? Let's look at this interesting story from antiquity. Let's go back to ancient Greece, okay? Because you may know that there is a, a creature that's part human and part bull, and that creature is the Minotaur, right? Have you heard of the Minotaur before? Here we have two examples. Um, now the image on the right is from antiquity. It dates around late sixth, early fifth century BCE, Theseus killing the Minotaur. And that's the same topic that you see in this sculpture, which is actually far more recent. It's from 1826 by uh, the artist Ramey. Um, what's interesting about this is that the ancient Greeks used the story of the Minotaur to really encapsulate the idea that humans have to make a choice because we are both animal and human and which side is going to win out. That's why this figure was part animal and part human, part bull at the top half and part human man at the bottom half. And the ancient Greeks loved the story of Theseus slaying the Minotaur because it basically said that humans will always overcome their base, animalistic, brutal nature and let reason and uh, understanding and intelligence and rationale win out. So that is why you see a number of these depictions, um, not just from antiquity, but throughout art history. That is our segue into modern art, because do we see the representation of bulls or the ox or even the minotaur in modern art? Yes, we do. I want to make you aware of this painting. Now, this painting is very challenging as some uh, paintings from modern, modern art can be. Do you know who painted this? This is by our friend Pablo Picasso. The title is Minotaur and Dead Mare in Front of a Cave from 1936. And I gotta ask, what do you think this painting is about? I want you to take all of the things that we've talked about thus far and use that to read this painting. Let's do it together, shall we? Here we have a Minotaur. He looks like he's either exiting the cave, or maybe he's backing into it. Hmm. He has a dead horse in his arms. The cave is behind him and it's very dark and we've got two very nondescript, mysterious hands coming out of the cave. And on the far right, we see a young girl with flowers in her hair watching this scene from behind some sort of architectural piece of stone perhaps, 
and she looks like she's holding up a veil, a very thin veil. So I want to ask you, what is Picasso talking about in this particular painting? Well, I got to say this Minotaur is pretty creepy, right? We can all agree on that, right? It's very disturbing and unsettling. And there is a clue as to the time period about possibly what he is talking about. What's going on in the world in 1936? Hmm? And more specifically, what's going on in Spain? That's Pablo Picasso's home country. I want you to look at this painting through the eyes of history and think, is this Picasso's comment on the Spanish Civil War? I'm going to let you ponder that because I think it really is. I want you to think about all the different parts and how they work together to tell Picasso's perspective on what civil war does to a country. Because he backs up this painting with a, another one that's even more famous than this painting. And you may have seen it or heard of it. This is his painting, Guernica. This was painted in 1937. It's kind of a big deal, literally. It's ginormous. It's 11 feet by six inches tall and 25 feet by six inches long. So it is huge. You can't miss it. And when an artist goes big like that, there's usually a pretty serious reason behind it. Why did he name this painting Guernica? Boy, there's a lot of sadness anger, anguish going on in this particular painting. It was named after the town Guernica, which was bombed in 1937 by Franco's Nazi Condor Legion on loan via Germany. What makes this painting so heartbreaking is the fact that Guernica was bombed in the middle of the week on, the, on their public market day. That means the city square was filled with women and children who were buying the fruits and vegetables that they needed to survive for the rest of the week. And Picasso's really making a comment on the horrors of war. And what does he include? We see a bull. We see a bull. And I gotta say, it's interesting that we talked about the Minotaur being part animal and part human, and the idea of which side is going to win out, the base, brutal animal side or the reasonable, logical, rational human side. And I think Picasso is making his opinion and his perspective heard. Think about how we use the term the bull and the ox in our everyday language in the 21st century, because we do with these very interesting turns of phrase. We call people bullheaded or that they are as stubborn as an ox. We say, don't give me that bull when someone we think someone is lying to us, or you grab the bull by the horns, right? Kind of has more of an aggressive feel, doesn't it? Or if someone is like a bull in a china shop, Oh, that's, uh, bulls don't go in china shops, right? You mess with the bull, you get the horns. Oh, that even sounds kind of um, violent, doesn't it? Don't have a cow or a cash cow. Why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? So I have to ask you, how has the symbol of the bull and the ox evolved over time? Because we started out our discussion saying, in the East, it was a symbol of spirituality, patience, um, submissive servitude, and the idea of um, pursuing your faith and steadiness and dedication. Boy, have we come a long way from that. Think about the Lamborghini, a supercar, really powerful and aggressive. Red Bull gives you wings. We have the Chicago Bulls, but we also have the bull market don't we, when we talk about Wall Street and stocks and bonds and the Dow, it really makes you wonder how these symbols evolve over time. 
And I think it's a really powerful message that we have to constantly keep up with these symbols and watch how they change. And I think that's pretty cool, don't you? Thank you so much for joining me for yet another video. Um, if you have a dollar or two that you could donate to my virtual tip jar, that would be incredible and it would mean so much to me. If not, that's fine. If you could like these videos, share them, and maybe subscribe to my YouTube channel, that would be awesome. Thank you so much. I hope you will join me for the next video. Until next time, thanks everyone. Bye.